Welcome to the League of Nerds comic book segment number 72. I'm John Cooney here to talk to you about comics released the 12th of June, 2013. Beginning as usual with my first five, meaning these are the first five books I intend to read this week, and I'll give you a little more depth on them, starting with at number one, Walking Dead number 111. Lucille is going to be so jealous. Series writer Robert Kirkman recently explained how the characters in The Walking Dead evolve. Quote, I think as the timeline progresses in The Walking Dead, it hits a point after a while where you kind of go, I've seen Rick and his group survive and how they survive, so that makes sense. But now that they've encountered new groups of characters that have been living in the world for two or three years in their timeline, how have they survived? The answer to that is, some unique individuals like Ezekiel and Negan and the Jesus character on the hilltop seem to have adapted to this world. You're going to see more and more characters that are bizarre and a lot stranger. These are characters that have been so affected by this world that they're living in, they're vastly different from people we've met thus far. This book has been around long enough now that we've seen a lot of normal people, and normal people have grown into crazy individuals or hardened individuals. Now it's kind of fun to come to characters at that point. We can just assume they've come to that point, not having seen the growth to that point, but just coming at them in this really bizarre light. In Ezekiel's case, you introduce this guy and people go, wait, who is this guy and where did he come from and how did he get that tiger? It's just completely strange to me and way more far-fetched than anything we've seen in this book. But over time, I can start to peel back the layers and show how things exist or how tigers are still around in this world or how he caught it and taught it. It's stuff that makes sense after a while. I do like the idea of pushing the envelope and further exploring how this world is now through characters who are pretty unique. At the end of the day, while there's a lot about Ezekiel that seems strange, you want people to see he's a leader. If you're a leader, you need to be a crazy dictator who leads through fear or someone who's respected and liked, someone who seems to have a good head on their shoulders and actually produces results where someone would go, hey, I'm going to stick around this guy because I want to survive. The thought behind all these pockets of civilization existing in this book is that people in this kind of situation have realized that surviving on your own long term is pretty much an impossibility. In order to survive, these people would have to group together and form communities just so they can continue to exist. That's why we're starting to see all these little pocket civilizations, and everyone will have a leader or a group of leaders that are holding them together. That's what we're exploring right now. Close quote. And number two, we've got Star Wars number six. When he and Chewbacca are cornered by Imperials, Han Solo resorts to an improvised plan with the most dangerous results imaginable. Meanwhile, half a galaxy away, Princess Leia and Wedge Antilles prepare for certain death, unaware that Luke Skywalker has an improvisation of his own, and Darth Vader is watching. Series writer Brian Wood explained his favorite part of the series. It's the uh, X-Wing battles. Yeah. Really. I don't know. <laughs> See, now you're making me out to be a, be a nerd. But that's, no, that's no. really true. No that's, doubt, man. <laughs> that's that. I'm also sort of, uh, I'm also really giving, giving Leia a lot of screen, screen time. Um, kind of making her like the emotional core of this run. Right. So that's kind of fun because she's not usually, I mean, she's definitely in all those films, but she's never sort of the fo- focus, you know. Right, yeah. It's just like I always tell everybody: all, all, all you have to do is know is know that that first film, the like the real first film, you know. Um, that's not, that's it. Yeah. And so when you're when you're uh, mapping out your stories and doing your outlines of that, do you ever kind of pause and be like, well, let me get some action figures, let me see what this looks like? Uh, <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. <laughs> but what I do, I mean, it's so. I mean, every so often I get asked if it's really hard to like write. Character, write for these such well-known characters, yeah. but I find it's really, it actually help, helps me because it's so easy to just imagine the actor's voice in my head, right. like like reading what I'm writing, and I can say if, if, if it does sound sound like something um, Harrison Ford would say, you yeah. know. At number three, we've got Wolverine in the X-Men number 31, Hellfire Saga Part 1. Welcome to the Hellfire Academy. There's little chance you'll survive the experience. The most villainous school you've ever seen has its grand opening. With teachers like Mystique, Sauron, Mojo, Wendigo, and Master Pandemonium, there's no limit to the terrible things you'll learn. Can Wolverine and the X-Men find the school before their kidnapped students are turned into villains? Series writer Jason Aaron said recently, quote, This certainly is something that's been building for quite a while. These Hellfire Club kids first popped up during Schism. This is what their story has been building towards that whole time. And a lot of other stuff that has been building since issue number one. The character arcs of kids like Edie and Quentin Choir and some of our more oddball characters like Toad and Husk. All of that has been building towards this. Those character arcs and storylines start to come to a head at the same time in a big story that involves probably more characters than I've ever written in one single story, close quote. He went on to explain the Hellfire Club, quote, They enjoy making money off mutants. 
They teach people to be afraid of mutants because the Hellfire sells sentinels. The more scary mutants there are out there, the more sentinels they sell. They've always opposed Wolverine School because the school is about integrating humans and mutants, and that's not something they want to happen. With the Hellfire Academy arc, they decide to start their own school, and they bring in a few characters from the student body of the Jean Grey School, as well as some new characters. They're all there with a very specific story in mind. It's all part of the ongoing plans. Close quote. Number four, we've got Batman number 21. Witness the new 52 origin of the Dark Knight in Batman Zero Year. Twists and turns are around every corner as Bruce Wayne takes the final steps towards his destiny. And in the backup story, learn more about how different Gotham City was at this dangerous point in time. Series writer Scott Snyder explained, quote, The purpose is really that DC approached us and said, Batman doesn't have an origin in the new 52. He's one of the few characters that we haven't done that with. Wonder Woman and Superman with Action Comics and Aquaman and all these characters have had their origins sort of redone. Martian Manhunter and Cyborg. Batman is really the only one we've stayed away from. When you look at the actual math of it, the way James Jr. would be six years old, Selina Kyle is no longer who she was in year one, Jim Gordon has a different origin, the Falcons have a different origin, all that stuff means that year one couldn't have happened the way that we read it. When DC came out and said, we need an origin for him, and we had this big idea, this different story you haven't seen with a really different tone. The idea is, if we're going to do it, we might as well do something that's going to be fun and our own. If we're going to be writing this story that's essentially so sacred and do it in a way that you haven't seen before that matters to us, it has to inform you about the Batman you've been watching in our series. You're going to learn some stuff about the timeline, but the project isn't about making sure you understand why Damien is the age that he was and how different Robins came about and that stuff. That's not the goal of it. The goal of it is to try to give you something that's big, fun, and your own, and big and modern because there wasn't anything there in terms of the origin for the Batman and the New 52. Close quote. He went on to say, quote, I'm really nervous about it. It's definitely cost a lot of sleepless nights. But at the end of the day, when you know that there isn't something there for Batman's origin and you have an idea that sort of approaches all the things you've been doing in your own work and addresses why he is the way he is and this is what he means to us and you don't do it, I feel like you're doing a bigger disservice to the fans and the readers. You have to try it. I hope everybody out there understands that this wasn't a project where we decided we're going to take down the origin that exists. But instead, we were asked to do an origin because one wasn't in place that could exist in the new 52. It became about telling the best story that we could that would be the most fun. It's something we really care deeply about. I think it's the best thing we've done so far. In that way, I want you guys to understand that it was never a project saying, oh, let's take apart the origin that exists and do something different. It was about Batman's really the last character in the 52, or one of the few characters that hasn't had his origin explained. Close quote. And number five, we've got Superman Unchained number one. When 13 satellites fall from the sky in one day, the logical suspect is Lex Luthor, even though he's still locked up in prison. But a stranger question remains. If Superman didn't stop the last satellite from falling, who did? There's a mystery hidden where even Superman can't see it. Can the Man of Steel drag a decades-old secret into the light? Don't miss the debut of Red Hot News series from two of comics' brightest superstars, Scott Snyder and Jim Lee. Series writer Scott Snyder said, quote, I really like stories where the characters are challenged by their worst fears. Superman is facing someone new and it's going to shake him. It's not horror, and there's humor between the characters, but it's definitely about dealing with something that frightens him. This is basically the Superman story I would tell if I could only do one. It's got the full cast and Lex Luthor, but also new psychological elements that I don't think people have really seen with Superman before. Four, close quote. Series artist Jim Lee added, quote, This is a pretty self-contained story, so you don't have to have read the new 52 action comics, Justice League, or Superman in order to understand what's happening. We want to welcome new readers, and even though it's coming out around the time of the new movie, we're telling our own story, and they're telling their story. Close quote. Rounding out the top ten at number six, we've got Guardians of the Galaxy number three. The biggest new book of the year continues as the Guardians' first story wraps up. The mysteries leading to the next great Marvel event become clearer. At number seven, we've got Doomsday Point One, number two of four by John Byrne. Is there any hope humanity can recover from Doomsday? Odds seem low as our intrepid team discovers the survivors include the worst of the worst. At number eight, we've got Peter Panzerfaust, number eleven, Cry of the Wolf. Having faced the wrath of the Hook, Peter and the Lost Boys join forces with the Braves in guerrilla warfare from their secret hideout in the sticks. This time, Felix is a man with the memories, and as Mr. Parsons soon learns, he's not eager to revisit that life. It's a new story arc beginning here. Perfect jumping on point. At number 9, we've got Savage Wolverine number 6. A new arc starts here. 
Wolverine plus Electra plus Spider-Man times Wells plus Madeira minus rules equals pain. And at number 10, we've got Uncanny X-Force number 6. Secrets from the future and the past come to haunt Uncanny X-Force. What does Phantom X want from Betsy? What does Betsy want from Cluster? What does Cluster want from Phantom X? What does Bishop want from the 21st century? A body count or a good burger? And Los Angeles, lock up your humans. There's a new mutant on the loose. For the best of the rest this week from DC, we've got American Vampire, The Long Road to Hell number 1, one shot. Fan favorite character Travis Kidd, the vampire hunter who likes to bite them back, makes his return in this new American Vampire one-shot. It's a story burned deep into the American psyche, two young lovers, a stolen car, and the open road. But these young lovers are newly turned vampires trying to fight the blood-sucking urge inside them. To make matters worse, they've got a pack of angry vampires on their tails, plus badass vamp killer Travis Kidd. He's tracking the heartbreak killers across the heartland, but can he stop them before it all ends in tragedy? This one-shot special sets the stage for the American Vampire relaunch later this year. Next, we've got Batgirl number 21. Has Barbara gone too far? How can she carry on as Batgirl? What choices will she make, and how will her new, decidedly deadly admirer affect her decision? We've also got Masters of the Universe, The Origin of Hordak number 1, one shot. How does one go about becoming a demigod? And what the heck is a demigod anyway? These questions and more will be answered in Masters of the Universe, The Origin of Hordak. Travel to the distant past and learn how the old gods died and how Hordak went from being a conqueror of the cosmos to something very like a god. We've also got Nightwing number 21. Desperate to find a ghost from his past, Nightwing turns to the prankster for help, unaware that they are both targets of the mask killer. Next, we've got Suicide Squad number 21. The Suicide Squad takes over Belle Reeve. When the team decides they've had enough of Amanda Waller's manipulations, they turn the tables on their boss. But Waller still has a few tricks up her sleeve, or more accurately, a bomb in everyone's neck. Next, we've got Superboy number 21. Crypto comes to the rescue as Superboy is on the trail of Dr. Psycho and the new mysterious hive that has infested Metropolis. And we've got World's Finest number 13. As Desaad's Hellhound hunts Power Girl and Huntress, the duo must struggle with how far underground they'll go before they can turn the tide and take the fight back to the man who's been impersonating the missing Mr. Terrific. From Marvel this week, we've got Alpha Big Time number 5 of 5. The greatest superhero story ever told comes to a startling conclusion. Alpha and Superior Spider-Man team up to fight Zeta. The Marvel Universe ends here. Footnote, Marvel Universe may not actually end. Next, we've got Avengers Assemble number 16, The Enemy Within, part 2 of 5. Who wants you for dinner? The Brood. Spider-Woman and Captain Marvel declare war on the Magnetron. Who? And Hawkeye has a bright idea. Next, we've got Avenging Spider-Man number 22. The Punisher and Spider-Man have never seen eye to eye, but this is the superior Spider-Man. What does Frank Castle think about Spider-Man's new hard-edged attitude? Plus, Mysterio is back, or is he? The superior Spider-Man has a few questions for old fishbowl head, but the Punisher has something else for him. Bullets. We've also got Thor, God of Thunder, number 9, God Bomb, part 3 of 5. Three Thors side by side at last, united in battle. But will even that be enough, as Gore the God Butcher's grand plan nears completion and his powers grow beyond anything we've seen before? Next, we've got Ultimate Comics X-Men number 27, the earth-shattering conclusion to natural resources. The big battle for Utopia is here. Finally, some answers about Psylocke. When the dust clears, who will lead the mutant nation? And we've got Wolverine number 4, the conclusion of hunting season. New York City is under biological attack. Can Wolverine save it before it's too late? Guest starring Nick Fury. From Dark Horse, we've got X number 2. X has a bone to pick with Arcadia's political kingmaker Berkshire, and the two share some face time. Meanwhile, Lee's online expose attracts some murderously angry readers. Swarzynski and Nguyen take on Dark Horse's classic vigilante. From Image Comics, we've got Manhattan Projects number 12, The Fermi Paradox. Learn the secret of Enrico Fermi, and more importantly, if someone is out there, why haven't we found them yet? The thrilling feel-good bad science series continues in the Manhattan Projects number 12, The Fermi Paradox. And from Valiant, we've got Harbinger Wars number 3 of 4, Enter Hardcore. Las Vegas is burning, and the situation on the ground is about to go from bad to worse, with the firefight between the Harbinger Foundation, Bloodshot, and the Renegades spiraling out of control. Project Rising Spirit has only one desperate option left to prevent the conflagration from spreading. 
it's time to bring the Deep Black Weapons Development Project, Designation Hardcore, back online. But are they a scalpel or a sledgehammer? And can they be trusted with the enormous power they wield? What happens in Vegas may just destroy the rest of the Valiant Universe. Out in trades this week, we've got Michael Avon Alming's The Victories Volume 1 trade paperback. Not long from now, all that will stand between you and evil are the victories. Heroes sworn to protect us from crime, corruption, and the weird designer drug known as the float. As one member hits the streets looking for blood, he discovers himself touched by a painful past through the powers of a psychic. Will this trauma cause him to self-destruct or to rejoin the good fight? Collects the five-issue miniseries. Okay, so that's just a look at the few of my favorite books out this week. There's still plenty of others available. I broke out all the Marvel titles this week in their own video, as well as a separate video for all of DC, and even a video with the top independent publishers. And you can find them all on my YouTube channel at he's got issues.com, and we'll also have links up on the League of Nerds.com, our Facebook page, so be sure to like us there too. And of course, you can follow everything I'm reading on Facebook, Pinterest, Tumblr, or Twitter. You can find links to everything at he's got issues.com. And a reminder that both He's Got Issues and the League of Nerds are proud members of the Comics Podcast Network. So until next week, I'm John Cooney, and I've got issues.